Krishna, 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 Hari, Nithai Ghor, Hari, Ram, Hari, 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 Okay, so I don't really need this guy. No, 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 I'm not, not going to do the verse. Yeah, just put it up there anyway. Can you uh, slide this guy out of the way? Can you move this table? <laughs> Okay, I could, I could speak in another language, but you wouldn't understand it. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Did you hear my class today, online? You didn't? Oh, you're, okay, good, that's good, because <laughs> cause it's the same class that I'm going to give again. <laughs> So today, om again, timidandasya ginajana salakaya, chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri guru vena maha, ma om vishnu padaya krishna pristaya bhutale shimakti bhakti vedanta swami iti namine, namaste sadraswati deve gauravani pachari ne ne visesa sunyavari pasyat yate stari ne. Pancha kalpa trubhishya kripa sindhu bhevacha paditanam pavane bhyo vaishnave bhyo namaho namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Siva Sadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 so today and uh, there's the next week is just a whole series of great personalities, appearances, disappearances, and we also have Rahadev, Lord Ityananda on Thursday, and then Madhavacharyas, we also have Ramnuchacharya, all these coming up in Nakadasi, all coming up within the next five or six days. So chock full of nectar. <laughs> so today is, uh, you know, Bhishmastami is a very important day because Grandfather Bhishma Dave is actually a very, very, very great personality. So um, I'll narrate a little bit of the history of his appearance and some of his activities. Um, there was some problem in the heavenly planet and uh, one sage, his name was Vashishta, and he had a common denu cow. So the Vasus, the mentions that there are eight Vasus, but somehow it seems like in this case there were seven Vasus. And the Vasus are just, a, they're a particular type of demigod. Actually, it says in the Bhagavatam that if you want to get riches, money, you pray to the Vastus. <laughs> uh, they seem to give material opulence. So they had a 
they did a wrong thing. They stole Vashishta's Kamandeno cow. And then Vashishta found out, and then he tracked them down and caught them all. And then he cursed them that all of you should, because of your offense, you have to take birth in the, on the, in the, in the middle planetary systems. In other words, on this planet. So to come down here is a curse. <laughs> We're thinking this is such a nice place, but to, to get, take birth here is a curse. The demigods think, oh my God, those humans are suffering so much. Uh, so, but they pleaded with Vashishta, please, please, you know, we don't want to really go down there and suffer. He said, well, okay, but because you are repentant and you're offering, you're sorry for your offense, I can mo modify it that you will take birth in the womb of Ganga Devi, personification of the Ganges River, and after your birth, as soon as your birth, you will come back to the heavenly planets immediately. Except one. His name was Diu, D-Y-U. Because he was the person that engineered the thievery, he will have to live a life on the heaven, in the material world. But still, his life will be glorious. He will be a great scholar and a very expert martial artist very adept in martial skills. So, one day, one particular king, his name was Shantanu. Shantanu in his previous life was a great king also. His name was Mahabisha. And Mahabisha had attained the realm of Brahmaloka. He came here, he got all the way up to Brahmaloka after he finished his ruling of the Earth planet. He was such a glorious king, many good credits, many wonderful deeds. One day, uh, in the heavenly planets, Ganga Devi was there, and Ganga Devi, there was a wind blowing, and it blew her clothing a little bit off her body, and her body was exposed. All the sages and saints immediately turned their head another way, not to look, except Mahabisha. <laughs> he looked at Ganga Devi and stared at her. Brahma saw what he did, and therefore he became a little upset and said, "Because you have, you know, committed this uh, this wrong activity, you will have to be born again on the earth." <laughs> So that birth was Santanu, so he came down. And Santanu was a great king, and he had no wife at that particular time, and so he was looking for a wife. So he went hunting in the forest and saw this beautiful, very attractive, very sweet-looking, and very shy-looking lady. And immediately, you know, the Kshatriyas, they're very attracted to women. <laughs> as the nature of the Kshatriya Dharma, especially good-looking ladies. And so he was mesmerized, hypnotized by her beauty, and he proposed marriage to her. Uh, she was immediately attracted to him also, and she said, yes, I'll agree to become your wife, but on one condition, that anything I do whether it's auspicious or inauspicious, you don't question that. And if you do, I leave. So, you know, he's infatuated by her, and so he agrees, so they get married. And so after some time, a child is born. Now this lady was Ganga Devi. <laughs> so uh, a child is born. And she takes the child and brings it to the Ganga River and throws the child in the river. And then the next year another boy is born, second child, and she does the same. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Every child that was born immediately she took and threw in the Ganges. These were the Vasus, they were finishing up their reactions and they went back to the heavenly planets. But 
Santana was watching his, what his wife is doing, and he's becoming a little unhappy, <laughs> upset. But then he remembered he can't question her. If you get a marriage like that, you might be in trouble. <laughs> so, um, this next child, the seventh child, um, when he, she, after was born, she was going to take him and do the same, but Santana said, stop, this is enough. What are you doing? Why are you killing all our children? And she said, thank you. It was nice knowing you. <laughs> I'll see you around. <laughs> this one is yours. You may keep him and grow him to become your son. I'm going. And she left immediately. So now he had a son, and he named the same Devavrata. <laughs> So this Deva Rata was growing up, and he was very intelligent by nature. Of course, he had a great father and a great mother. And then at one time, he trained under Parasaram and learned the science of martial arts. He had the best training. Um, his father, again, was without a, a wife. And one day again, he was, he was doing some puja down by the Ganges River, and he noticed that the Ganges River was not flowing steadily. So he decided to find out why, so he followed the Ganga up to where he saw there was some block there. And there was something happening there. There was a fisherman, and this fisherman was doing something. And then he noticed in that area where he went, there was a very sweet, perfumey, smell that was so fragrant and he was wondering where is it coming from and alongside nearby not, not alongside but nearby the fisherman was his daughter Sachivati and she was very very beautiful and that was the sweet aroma he was smelling it was coming from her Prabhupada comments on this he says that when women are born in fishermen family they are very beautiful. <laughs> they have figures like, you know, a fish, you know. <laughs> so he became again attracted and immediately he decided to ask the fisherman to give permission for his daughter for marriage. The fisherman said, well, I understand you are the king, but you have a son already. And if you married my daughter, then her son will not be the king. And he will be pushed out by your son. So I cannot give permission. So he was very happy. Uh, I'm sorry, unhappy. Yeah, he, and he went home. And he was very morose, very unhappy. And Devavrata, his son, noticed that his father was very unhappy. And so... He asked him why, and then he explained. So then David Ratha decided to do something. So he went to the fishermen and explained that, you know, I am the son of, the, of King Santanu, and he wants to marry your daughter. I know you think it's also good, but because I am here and you're afraid that I will take over the kingdom, therefore you're not giving your daughter. Therefore, I agree not to take the throne and this, the son of your daughter can be, had, become king. The fisherman said, well, that's very nice, but I can't agree. I won't agree. Why? Well, because you will marry, and then you will have a son, and then there will be competition for the throne again. So I can't agree. So then Devarata said, all right. I want to please my father, so I take a vow. I vow that I will never get married in my whole life. I will stay brahmachari. Now, as soon as he said that, some omen came from the sky saying, Bhishma, Bhishma, twice. And, he, and then he understood that omen, Bhishma, means terrible vow. For a Kshatriya to not to get married 
Very terrible vow. Very terrible vow. But he agreed. And then the fisherman said, fine. If you agree not to have any children and not to take the throne, I'll give my daughter to your father. And so she went. They got married. And there was two sons, Chitra, Chitra Ganda, Chitrangada, Chitrangada was one of the sons, and Vichitavirya was the other son, was born from Santanu and Satyavati. Now, Sitranga took the throne and became the king, but there was one Gandharva who became a little envious of Chitrangada because he had the same name as him. He didn't like him because he had the same name. <laughs> so this Gandharva attacked him, and there was a fight, and the Gandharva killed the king. <laughs> so now the king was killed, and there was nobody on the throne. So Vichitavarya was the only one left, and so he needed to get married. So Bhishva, who was Devavrata, now who became Bhishva, decided to find some wife for Vichitavarya. And so he went and there was a sacrifice being performed and there was some ceremony, some festival. And he came and he kidnapped three sisters, Amba, Ambili, Ambalika, and Ambaka. Amba, Ambalika, and Am, Ambaka. Yeah. Three sisters. And he brought them back to get married to his, uh, you could say his stepfather or stepbrother, yeah, stepbrother. Uh, but Vichitavarya was, he became very, very ill, and soon after that, but even before the marriage, he died. A wonderful story. <laughs> Mahabharata. <laughs> Mahabharata, yeah. So he died. So now what to do? So which, uh, now, um, Sachivati, she had, she was, she was previously married to um, Par, Parasara Muni, and they had a child, and that child was Vyasadeva, the original author of the Vedas, Vyasadeva. So Vyasadeva um, uh, acted in relationship to Vichitavarya, who was not, who now was no longer living, and two of these wives he impregnated, and that's the, that's where the, there were three sons. There was Vidura, Dhritarashtra, and Pandu came from them three. Okay. Now one of the ladies, Amba that was captured by Bhishma Dev. She was, because she got captured by Bhishma Dev, she got attached to him. But he wouldn't marry her. And she insisted, you marry me, you know. And then she went, she was gonna go, he, he sent her back. And she went back to the husband who was going to marry her, whose name was Shalva. And he said, no, you've been captured by Bhishma Dev, therefore you're, you're no longer you know, suited to be my wife, so you marry him. And now she's in a, a, a dilemma. Nobody's gonna marry her, and she wants to marry Bhishma Dev, and Bhishma Dev is a brahmachari. So she insisted, and he told her, I have taken a lifelong vow of brahmachari, and my vow is more important than my life. I can give up, even if Indra, you know, attacks me, I can never give up my vow. So she became angry and decided to get some revenge. <laughs> so what she did is she um, performed, uh, she went, no, she went to Parasaram and said, you know, your disciple, he refuses to marry me, he kidnapped me, so you should make him marry me. So Parasaram was convinced, yes, all right. Yeah, this he, he made the, he he did this so he should marry you. So Parasaram came to Bhishma and said you should marry her. Bhishma said, 
to Parasurama, you know, my vow is more important than my life, I will not marry. He said, if you don't marry me, then you have to fight me. <laughs> Parasurama. <laughs> so, Bhishma said, Bhishma Dev said, we will fight. <laughs> so they had a fight. And Bhishma Dev won. He defeated Parasuram in the fight. And Parasuram was so amazed to see the, the fighting skill of Bhishma Dev that he blessed him and said, because you have defeated me in this battle, all glories. <laughs> and he left. <laughs> so now, Amba, she's wondering what to do. <laughs> Her first attempt was a failure. So now she starts performing austerities to Lord Shiva. And finally, after Shiva appear, uh, appears to her and says, well, the only way you can get, get back at Bhishma Dev is that you have to die and be reborn as a soldier in the upcoming battle between the Pandavas and the Kurus. And therefore, you can fight against Bhishma Dev and kill him. <laughs> so she, took, she left her body and took birth again as a woman. And now a woman can't go on a battlefield and fight. So she's thinking how to do that. So she traded her, her female gender with a yaksha. And he, beca he became a girl, and she became a man. <laughs> and now he, was, now he joined the Pandavas, knowing that Bhishma Dev would be on the other side. And his name was Shikandi. And this is an interesting, <laughs> you see how all this intrigue <laughs> starts to play out. So of course, later on, we know that Bhishma Dev um, was under the employment of um, of Diodhana, yeah. Why did he take the side of Diodhana? There's two reasons. One is the external reason. The external reason was he was a Kshatri and he had no place anywhere. And Diodhana, he was very intelligent, very cunning, very very diplomatic. So he offered him a nice position. And you can be the you can be the you along with Dronacharya will be the leaders of my troops. You will be, you know, the main person to lead the battle, along with Dronacharya. And so he gave him all facilities, he gave him residence, he gave him opulence, he gave him so many things. So Bhishma Dev felt obliged and he joined the side of Diodhana. But he had affection for the Pandavas, especially for Arjun. And he really loved the Padavas as his own grandchildren because actually they were because in the in the, in the, in the uh, when Vyasadeva impregnated those girls those was Pandava and Dhritarashtra who were born so he was he was considered to be the grandfather of Yudhisthira um, Arjun and Bhima so he had affection for the Pandavas so on the battlefield. Although he was annihilating many of the Pandava soldiers, he wasn't fighting to his capacity. Oh, I've left out one thing. When his father realized that his son had done this great austerity, not accepting marriage, just to give him a wife, Santanu, who was very powerful, he blessed him. He said, you will die only when you want to die. You will die only when you want to die. So he had that power that he would never leave his body unless he, when he decided to leave. So now he's on the battlefield and he's invincible. Nobody could fight against him. Bhishma Dev could annihilate the entire Parma, par, the whole Pandava army by himself. He was so powerful. He even defeated Parasura. Uh, but he wasn't fighting to his capacity. And Diodhana knew it. So he said, you know, my dear grandfather, I can see you're out there fighting, but you are not fighting to your capacity. And therefore, you know, you shouldn't, if you're going to have fight, you should fight to your capacity. So that was an insult. To tell a Kshatri of enough fighting to his durability is a great insult. 
So Bhishma became a little up angry. He said, all right, tomorrow I will kill the five Pandavas in battle. And I have these five arrows, and with each, each one of these arrows, I will kill the five Pandavas. So Diodhana said, okay, very good. Let me hold the arrows for you. And I'll give you give them in tomorrow when the battle begins. Because they would fight only up to sundown. They would never fight beyond once the sun went down, the battle ended for the day. And then in the next day when the sun came up to battle, they only would fight in the presence of the sun. <laughs> that was Shatriya codes also. Like that. Not that they sneak around at night and throw bombs, you know. <laughs> They were, these were Kshatriyas, they had, they had honor, they had valor, they had religion. So, Krishna saw, understood what was happening. So he said to Arjuna, because Krishna knew that Bhishma could do that, he could annihilate the Pandavas with no problem. So Krishna told Arjuna, you remember Arjuna, Duryodhana, owes you a, a promise, he promised to give you something, now you go take that promise. And you ask him for the five arrows. So he went, and uh, at night, the, the camps on both sides, sometimes they would meet together and just sit down and have some refreshments and talk. They were friends in the evening, but during the day they would fight each other. <laughs> so Doryodhana, welcome Arjun. He said, oh Arjun, you've come. Why have you come? There's some reason for your coming? Yes. You remember, you, oh, you offered me one gift? Yes, I remember. What would you like? Whatever, I can end it. Would you like the kingdom? No, no. We should continue the fight. Well, what would you like? I want those five arrows you have. Do you know? Being a Kshatriya, keeps his word, gave the five arrows to Arjuna. The next day, when Bhishma realized, he said, This is the trick of Krishna. <laughs> he understood that Krishna had sent Arjuna to get those arrows. And so now, he fought really strong. And Ar Krishna knew that Arjuna was no match for Bhishma Dev. So he said, if you want to fight against Bhishma Dev, you have to put Shikandi, who hates Bhishma Dev, in front of you, because Bhishma Dev will not fight against Shikandi. Because Bhishma Dev knows Shikandi is a woman, and therefore, or a eunuch, it's mentioned either a woman or a eunuch, and a Kshatriya will not fight. A eunuch, you know what a eunuch is? No? A eunuch is somewhere in between male and female. <laughs> He's like a male, but he has no, no male propensities. <laughs> it, they're called eunuchs. It's called E-U-N-E-C-K. Or ACK, eunuch, and you can look it up as a definition. So when Bhishmadev saw that Sukhandi was on the chariot and guarding Arjun, he could understand, I can't fight against Sukhandi because she, and Sukhandi was fighting against Bhishmadev, and Bhishmadev was defending himself against Sukhandi, but he couldn't fight back. So now, this, this was an opportunity for Arjuna to fight against Bhishma Dev because now he had the, the assistance of Shikandi. But Bhishma Dev was able to somehow or other fight against Arjuna without becoming, without Arjuna getting killed. But then at one point, seeing Krishna on the chariot, and he knew Krishna was his lovable object, and he has a special rasa with Krishna. He fights with Krishna, that's how he exchanges love with Krishna. Because we understand from scripture that there are five primary rasas and seven secondary rasas. So one of the secondary rasas is the fighting spirit, it's called shivari. 
And so, now chivalry, S-H-I-L-V-R-Y, chivalry. <laughs> and now Bhishma Dev decides that I'm going to kill Arjuna. And the only way that he's not going to die is Krishna has to break his promise. Because Krishna said, I'll be on the chariot, but I'm not fighting. But when Bhishmadev started to fire the arrows at the chariot, he smashed the entire chariot where the chariot it was nothing left. Arjuna fell off the chariot along with Krishna, and the chariot was smashed. Now, Krishna jumps into action, thinking now, soon, Arjuna will be killed. So he picks up a cha the broken chariot wheel and holds it over his head like a chakra. And with his charter flying in the wind, he comes running at Bhishma Dev. You can see the picture. It's a beautiful picture. And Krishna's eyes are red hot. He's angry. And he's so angry that when he's running, his charter flies away in the wind, and he just keeps going. And he's charging at Bhishma Dev, and Bhishma Dev is loving it. And so now he's firing arrows at Krishna, and the, the arrows are hitting the body of Krishna. But Krishna is accepting these arrows as a lover accepts the love bites of the beloved. That's how it's described by Sridhar Swami in the commentary. <laughs> so now, Krishna is just charging at Bhishma Dev. And now, of course, Arjuna is still there. And then, after, and while he was fighting with Krishna, Arjuna jumps in and starts fighting against Bhishma Dev. And at that point, Bhishma Dev was, was hit with so many arrows by Arjuna that he actually fell off his chariot. And uh, he, uh, we see that now he, the whole battlefield stopped. Arjuna, uh, Bhishma Dev was lying on the bed of arrows. And there was arrows from his shoulders all the way down to his feet. He was filled with arrows. And the arrows were through his body, and they created like a bed. And he was laying on this. No, actually, yeah, yeah, Arjuna came and shot more arrows into the ground so, Ar so Bhishma Dev could lay on the bed of arrows, along with the arrows that were in his body. And then everything stopped, and everyone came around Bhishma Dev. And then Bhishma Dev was there, and even though he was in great pain, he decided not to die. Because he had that will that, that he could die whenever he wanted to die. And so this was in de the month of December. And therefore, the sun is in the southern hemisphere when it goes in its orbit. But when it comes to the month of January, at the beginning of this, it is called the solace, the winter solace, uh, the sun starts to make its trek to the northern hemisphere, and then, of course, the days get longer and the nights get shorter. So Bhishma Dev waited for that particular time when the sun was in that position, and therefore he stayed on the battlefield full of arrows for, it mentions, about three weeks, more than 18 days, something like three weeks. And during that time, uh, people were coming, offering him flowers, and he was giving advice to everyone. And then Krishna understood that Yudhisthira is feeling really unhappy because of the battle, so many people are being killed, so many animals were being killed because of him, because of bringing him to the throne as king. So he was unhappy. So Krishna took the opportunity to bring Yudhisthira to meet with Bhishma Dev. And Bhishma Dev spoke the science of how to rule the kingdom to Bhishma Dev, to, to, uh, 
to Yudhisthira every day while he was there. And Yudhisthira listened to everything and he learned everything on how to rule the kingdom according to religious and uh, Kshatriya principles. And he stayed. And, everyone, and it was amazing. At that time, Duryodhana came and Duryodhana offered um, Bhishma Dev some water, cool water to drink because, you know, he was suffering from those arrows. He refused. Although he was very thirsty and wanted water, when Duryodhana came to bring him water, he refused the water. Then Arjuna understood. So Arjuna shot an arrow into the ground, and when he did, a well came up and water came up, and with that water, he gave it to Bhishma, and Bhishma accepted it. Because Bhishma wanted to tell Arjuna, Duryodhana, I'm not with you. <laughs> I'm with the Pandavas. <laughs> That was the message. And so this went on. And then, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's described in this uh, chapter here. Uh, Bhishma talking about the different classes of ca ca describes counteraction, detachment, attachment, so many things. Um, Bhakti Tirta Swami Maharaj wrote two books called Leadership, Leadership One and Leadership Two. In the second book, he very carefully goes through the whole science of what Bhishma Dev gave to Yudhisthira. So if you want to learn what the actual details of those instructions were, it's in Bhakti Tirtha Swami's book, Leadership Two. Of course, you can find these same principles mentioned throughout the Bhagavatam, but they're not in one place, they're in various places, like that. So some people ask, why did Bhishma Dev take the side of Diodhana? And as I mentioned, there was a, there's a hidden reason that people don't know of. And then later on it was revealed by the Acharyas that Bhishma Dev did this externally because Duryodhana was, was maintaining him. But the internal reason, the real reason, the essence of his taking the side of Duryodhana was that he wanted to teach the world a lesson, a big lesson. What was that lesson? That no matter who you are, no matter how powerful you are, no matter how successful you are, no matter what you have, if you are against Krishna, you lose. That was the message. Because no one could defeat Bhishma Dev. But he wanted to show that even I am invincible, but still, being against Krishna means you lose. So this is a very powerful message for all of the devotees are everywhere in the world that as long as we take shelter of Krishna, as it, what is the last verse in the Bhagavad Gita? Huh? Yatra. Mm -hmm. Can someone give the translation of that last verse in the Bhagavad Gita? Yeah. The expert bowsman, yeah. Supreme archman. Supreme archman. Uh, always shields opulence and victory and um, great opulence in the land. Extraordinary power. Yeah, so that sums up the whole teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, the last verse. So wherever there is Krishna, there is always victory, opulence, extraordinary power, and morality. <laughs> So that's a good message for all of us. <laughs> stick with Krishna. <laughs> and sticking with Krishna means surrendering to Krishna more and more. It's not enough just to be initiated. It may, means that we have to fully depend on Krishna in every and all situations. 
with that full dependence, one becomes empowered to do wonderful things on behalf of the Lord. As it says, there are six principles which make up the process of complete surrender. This is mentioned by Sanatana Goswami and Sri Hari Bhakti Vilas. And three of the principles are complete dependence on Krishna in the form that he is the provider, maintainer, and protector of his devotee. He provides everything, he protects the devotee, and he maintains the devotee. This is the, one of the qualifications that Krishna likes to exhibit. He likes to take care of his devotees. But he does it in proportion to how much we surrender to him and how much we depend on him. So the more we move in that direction, the more we can feel his complete protection, his complete maintenance, his complete, and that he provides everything you need perfectly and completely. Because sometimes people don't have that faith and they look towards the material energy to fulfill these needs, Krishna says, all right, if you want to try it there. And they try. Just like a lot of times women come up to me and say, Maharaj, you know, I really need a husband. What am I going to do? So, you know, I used to tell them, just become more surrendered to Krishna and increase your devotional service. Stay steady and be patient. In due course of time, Krishna will make all the arrangements. And so many times it happens like that. But if they don't have that faith and that patience, then something else happens. Mm -hmm. hmm. So this was a beautiful message. And at the same time, when finally that time came, when it was time for Bhishma departure, then he had instructed everyone. I mean, Vyasa Dev was there, Narada Muni had come. Krishna stayed there that whole time with Bhishma Dev. Krishna's love for Bhishma Dev was really, really deep. And Krishna stayed there, and then of course that time when the sun came to that point in the sky, and then he just left his body. And it describes, I think it's in one of these verses, I'm not sure which verse it is. If you go down the page, can you just show, show the listings of the verses? Yeah, just just the translations where you have the, you know, the, it's a beautiful verse. It comes later in this chapter. It's after 26, that's for sure. We have the, the whole listing. Well, you have a dhoti, just wipe it on the dhoti. That's what dhotis are for. So, this is not... <laughs> Nine. Oh. Go all the way down. All the way down. Yeah, go past 26. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let my mind be fixed upon Lord Sri Krishna, whose motions and smiles of love attracted the damsels of Raja, the gopis. The damsels imitated the carrying. Bhishma Dev is glorifying the gopis. And now he's, he's looking for that same meditation that the gopis had. And then next verse was, he mentions the Raja Sujiya sacrifice, then go down farther. 42. There, this 40... Now I can meditate with full concentration upon that one Lord Sri Krishna now present before me because now I have transcended all the misconceptions of duality in regards to his presence in everyone's heart. It says, yeah, even in the hearts of the mental spec, he is in everyone's heart. The sun may be perceived differently, but the sun is one. Next verse. 
This is the beautiful verse. Knowing that Bhishma Dev had merged into the unlimited eternity of the Supreme Absolute, all present there became silent like birds at the end of the day. Beautiful. When the birds become silent and the day is ended and everything becomes peaceful. So this was Grandfather Bhishma Dev. And he, he he merged, or he 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 came into the the super soul, as it mentions here. He his mind and speech and action thus became, and he actually came into the unlimited eternity of the supreme absolute truth, the super soul. So he realized Krishna as the super soul, and so he attained that stage of realization. It's a really beautiful chapter. If you read the whole chapter, you'll be really amazed. And this is all that in this chapter, the fighting between Krishna and Bhishma Dev is also mentioned. So Bhishma Dev, he's one of the twelve Mahajans, Mahajano Yena Katasapanta, Tarko Pratishte Sutina Vibhinnam, Nasim Nasa Return. What is that verse? Tarko Pratishte Sutana Vibhinna. This verse is very important. Tarko Pratishta Sutina Vibhinna. Sutinam Vibhinna. It's from the Mahabharata. Uh, it's mentioned in different places in the Bhagavatam. Tarko is the first word. Yeah, could you read it? Yeah. The, the Sanskrit also, if you could. Mahajano yena kata sapanta. That translation is, this translation is really quite unique. This is quoted in Madalila 17.1. Dry arguments are inconclusive. A great personality whose opinion does not differ from others is not considered as a great sage. Simply by studying the Vedas, which are variegated, one cannot come to the right path by which religious principles are understood. The solid truth of religious principle is hidden in the heart of an unadulterated, self-realized person. Consequently, as the Shastra confirmed, one should accept whatever progressive path the Mahajanas advocate. Yeah. yeah, so by studying the Vedas, you cannot come to the conclusion. One has to understand the truth of religious principles because they are hidden in the hearts of the great souls. Mahajano yena gadasa panta. Panta means path. And so for us, we follow Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> and you might see differences between the acharyas, some of the things, not, not complete differences, but you'll find differences in all of the acharyas, but one has to follow their spiritual master, their pure devotee spiritual master, great souls, acharyas, not just a spiritual master, but one is acharya. But here it mentions the Mahajans. So there are 12 Mahajans, Brahma, Narada, Shiva, four Kumaras, uh, Kapila, Prahlad, Janaka, Bhishma, Yamaraj, who else? Uh, uh, Sukadeva Goswami. So there are 12 authorized persons to teach the principles of, and Bhishma Dev. Bhishma Dev is one of, the nine, one of the 12 Mahajans too. So he's not a small personality. Although he was a great fighter, king, he's still. And in the Bhagavatam, in one section, in the first canto, the principles 
that Bhishma Dev taught as a Mahajan are very nicely described. They're described there. So you can learn what he taught. Mm -hmm. And he said, one thing about love, he said, love means to repose all of one's affection on one personality. <laughs> that is love. Jai Shri Shri Panchatattva Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. So, thank you for the opportunity. I feel great happiness speaking about Bhishma Dev. It's mm. just, he's so, such a wonderful personality. His life, everything about it was glorious. <laughs> So, if there's anyone would like to comment or add anything to it, would please do so. Mm -hmm. I just curious, interested uh, information. You mentioned that he, he that he lies on the bed arrow for how many days? Well, I think it's mentioned something like 18 days, but. Um, I'm not sure of the number of days because it was what is called, uh, it's, usually, it's usually January 14th or 15th, what is that called? Particular, it's the day Lord Chaitanya took sannyas. Uh, Makara Sankranti? Mahakas, Makara Sankranti was the day he left. <laughs> because I heard that he was teaching Yudhishthir for 50 days. 50? 50 days, yeah. Possibly. And so here is mentioned, it, he lied on the bed arrows for 58 days. 58 days. Yeah, eight days during the Kurukshita because he fought on the 10 days. The 10th day. And then eight days more was the battle. The battle. And then Yudhishthir Maharaj for 50 days. So yeah. together, eight plus five, 50 is 58. Oh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. thank you, that's a nice point. Yeah, so 58 days he undergo, undergo this suffering, the pains of the arrows were there, but he had a duty to instruct Yudhisthira, because he knew Yudhisthira would be the king of the world, and, and he had the knowledge. And Krishna wanted him to do it, so <laughs> that was also there, <coughs> yeah. And one interesting, this is from Google, I don't know how it's re reliable, that he was old, how, how old he was? 170 years old. He said, here is the different number, 256 years. Really? <laughs> I heard 170, but you got 256? I mean, there are, that's not, I mean, it's not impossible, that is. Vapar Yuga is normal. I mean, it's yeah. small, it's little. <laughs> Well, it's the end of the Dwarpa Yuga. When Krishna leaves, then Kali Yuga comes in. So it's right at the end of the Dwarpa Yuga. I heard 170. So you, where did, what, what is the thought? Google Guru. Huh? Google Guru. Google Guru. <laughs> it's not the most reliable, but. <laughs> well, I mean, they have their sources, but I wonder what their sources are. Yeah, this is, yeah. It's their age, um, his birth and his um, yeah. his death uh, 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 years. Two hundred and fifty-six. Huh? Okay. Nice number. <laughs> but he was old. Yeah, that's why he was <laughs> called grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was the. Pitamaha, no? Pitamaha. Pitamaha, yeah, Pitamaha. Great grandfather. <laughs> yeah. Pit. Pita means father, Pita Maha means grandfather. Yeah, no, great friend, great grandfather, I think. Yeah, and he, but he had such affection for the Pandavas. Okay, so thank you for that additional knowledge. Okay, we'll stop here. And uh, Hare Krishna. <laughs> Shiller from Bad Kid. His Holiness.
चंद्रमा महाराज की yeah. Yeah.